All right, good morning and welcome to Calvary today. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us for our live stream service today. Uh, we've got some people in house this morning and we we're glad to see them and thank you guys for coming out to be with us. Uh, next Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, we will begin back with our regular gatherings here at a church family. So we hope you guys will make plans to be here next Sunday morning at 11. Uh, there's a couple of things that'll look different and we'll be posting some videos as we go through the week with the announcements. But just as a, a heads up right now, we're saying that there'll be no nursery. The nursery will be open, but not staffed. And then there won't be Sunday school or children's church for the first week or two. As we get into things, we'll see about getting that reopened as soon as we can. So make plans to be with us if you possibly can. We'd love to have you. Uh, and then uh, we'll also, there'll be some changes in our service that day too. So we'll be talking about the, how that looks as we get closer to it as well. But we're thankful to have this opportunity to come together. We'll be taking some time in the scripture here in just a few minutes. But before we do, I would like to just have a quick word of prayer, and then we'll go forward in our service. You ready? Father, we thank you for this day and the blessings that you give us. Lord, we thank you to have this opportunity to come to your house today. I pray the Lord you would be with us. Lord, not just here at this place, but Lord, at the other places where people are gathered to watch this service, to be a part of this the, the time together. I pray your blessings upon each and every one. And, Lord, for the services that are opening up today, I pray that, Lord, you'd be with them and just come and work in them. And, Lord, just may your spirit be manifest among them and, Lord, among us. And may your word take a root in our heart and in our lives. And, Lord, just have your way. Lord, there's so many prayer requests on our prayer list today. Lord, there's so many things that are going on. And I pray today that, Lord, you would work in every one of those as it best pleases you. Help us to put our faith and trust fully in you, and we'll thank you and praise you, Lord, for all that you do. We ask these blessings today in Jesus' name, amen. Now, today we're going to have uh, Craig and Stephanie Bishop will be singing a song for us, so I hope that you'll enjoy that. And after the song, I'll come back with a scripture, and then we'll go from there. Your promises are 
our yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. Amen. All right, so if you have your Bible today, we're going to be in a couple of different portions of Scripture. We'll be in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, I think we're going to read 12, 13, and 14. And then we'll be over in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 is where we'll take a little bit of our Scripture this morning. Um, I have enjoyed the study on Colossians an awful lot. There's been a lot here that I've learned. Um, and I, I try to read through the Bible a time or two a year, I, at least as we go through. And this year I've had time to really get some study in on this book and to look at the writings of the Apostle Paul to a, a church that had some questions and a church that was going through a hard place, a church that was really serving in a difficult time. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we get to it. But the Bible says here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us to be meet, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now I want to stop reading right there just for the sake of time today because I want to bring a message that I think will speak to the hour in which we live and a lot of the things that we're facing into. When you study this with the book of Colossians, and I know I'm sitting down, I may stand back up here in a minute, but I want to be sure that I get the points made on this message. When you start in the book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul starts out with them with their riches in Christ Jesus. He reminds them of everything that God has given us in Christ. Now, I want to take a minute here, and I don't have time to develop this all the way, because how would you ever fully cover everything there is to fully cover about Jesus Christ? And I would make everybody say amen if everybody was here today on this point. But what are their riches in Christ Jesus, okay? You have creation defined. We know how everything was made. Everything was made by him, for him, and everything is to him, okay? So we have that riches. And then we have the riches of salvation that's found in Christ Jesus. The Bible says we are complete in him. So, I mean, you see the riches that are in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to say this to you today. If you've been saved, your riches in Christ Jesus don't have anything to do with your emotional state. And by that I mean to say the, the riches that are in Christ Jesus don't go away based on whether or not I am afraid. My riches in Christ Jesus don't go away based on whether or not I have a question or whether I have a doubt or whether I've got something else going on in my life. Thank God our riches in Christ Jesus are based entirely on what God has done for us and God has given us in Jesus Christ. Now, I want to say this to you today. There's an awful lot in our world today that calls our attention. If you're not, uh, <laughs> if you're not distracted today, you're honestly not paying attention, all right? Or, or if you are distracted, maybe we're paying too much attention. But there's so many things that are happening in our world today that are big things. And so many things that are happening in society today that are, we are in this moment. And I want to remind us that our riches have not changed. None of, all of those things are moving, okay? All of those things are varying. All those things, there's a whole lot of things right now that just feel like they're all up in the air. But for a Christian, if we are settled in Christ Jesus, we have a sure foundation that's not moving. The anchor is holding. Thank God, right? I mean, we know that the anchor holds, and we can have confidence in what God has given us in Christ Jesus. So we see the riches, and I could preach the rest of the day on this, but then there's another thing that comes with the riches that is in Christ Jesus, and I'm, I just want to give you this right quick. The Bible here tells us that they had been delivered and translated, not just delivered, but delivered and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. The Bible tells us that we've been redeemed and forgiven. Thank God. I mean, we can take the afternoon and rejoice from now on on being redeemed and forgiven. We could talk about having peace with God and being reconciled. These are the riches that we have in Christ Jesus. So we look and see all of these things that God has given us. And then we move into the next part of the message, and that is not just the riches that God has given us, but we also see our responsibility, okay, that God has given us. We get to see and be reminded of the responsibilities we have because of the riches that have come to us. Now, there's an awful lot of preaching and teaching that only preaches the riches, okay? There's an awful lot of preaching and teaching that only reminds us of the goodness of God in our lives. It doesn't talk about what we ought to do next, 
It doesn't talk about how we ought to walk that out or what it looks like to live a Christian life or to walk worthy. The, Paul, the Apostle Paul calls it walking worthy of the Lord. I mean, so when we look at the greatness of the riches that God has given us and we look at the stature of the riches, I want to say that our responsibility is to walk worthy of all that God has done for us or all that God has put in our lives. Now, when you see this, and that this is the growth or the progression that we go through in the Christian life, and I preached on this this past Wednesday night. When we're talking about growth in the Christian life, we ought to, every one of us, be growing until the Lord takes us home. There should never be a time when we as Christians are done maturing because we're still in this old world. You're going to learn. You're going to grow. There are going to be perspectives that are going to change. There's going to be some times when the Holy Spirit will take the Word of God to our lives and it will straighten us out. Now, if that's not happening to us from time to time, there's, there's not anything wrong with the Bible. The Bible is still, the Bible says that it's sharper than any two-edged sword and still pierces asunder. I mean, so we still have the sharp weapon of the Spirit that God uses the sword of the Spirit in our lives. We still have the sweet voice of the Holy Spirit that calls us and reminds us of sin or reminds us of sinful attitudes or reminds us of things in our lives that ought not to be. And we ought to, when that happens, we ought not to go, there's something wrong. We ought to everyone be saying, thank God, God loves me enough to correct me. Thank God, God loves me enough to direct me. Now, and God did this with the church of Colossae. There was, they were being inundated, they were being overrun by false teachers. People had come in trying to add to the, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were, they were trying to add to the, the and, and here's what they were doing. They were willing for Jesus to be prominent, but they were not willing for Jesus to be preeminent. Okay, they were willing for Jesus to be part of their, their teaching. They were willing for Jesus to be part of their strategy, if you want to call it that. They were willing for Jesus to be part of their salvation, but they were not willing for him to be preeminent as the Bible gives him. So well, anytime somebody wants to talk to you about doctrine or somebody wants to talk to you about salvation, you can just ask a couple of quick questions to find out where that person really is. One, what do they do with Jesus Christ? Okay, what do they do with Jesus Christ? Now, you can put any doctrinal system in the world on this scale, okay? If they make less of Jesus than the Bible does, then they're wrong, okay? If they make less of Jesus than the Bible does, they are in error. And then the other thing that we can ask is, what do they think it takes to be saved? What do they think it takes to get to heaven? What does it take to be reconciled with God? Now, the, the Judaizers went around behind the Apostle Paul. Paul was going and preaching to the Gentiles the gospel of the grace of God. You must be born again. He was preaching to them that in Jesus Christ, Jews and Gentiles were now a cre new creation, which is the church. Okay, In, in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither Gentile or Jew. We're all now one in Christ Jesus, or we should be. Now, I'm not going to preach on that today. I'll probably come to that in a minute. But this message was a message that was needed at Colossae because the young Christians there were being tempted to add to salvation. They were being tempted to add works to salvation. They were being tempted to add the law to salvation. Now, I want to tell you something. If you add anything to grace, you've messed it up. If you add anything to the mercy of God, you've messed it up. If we add anything to what Jesus has done for us, we've messed it up. Sir, can I ask you a question? Ma'am, can I ask you a question? If we could have saved ourselves, why would Jesus have come to begin with? If the law would have redeemed us, why the cross? Okay, the Jesus came, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ says, you cannot redeem yourselves, I will redeem you. You could never save yourselves, I will save you. You could never deliver yourselves, I will deliver you. So we see the exclamation point that is the gospel message. So the Apostle Paul was teaching them and making sure they understood their responsibilities. Now I want to say this to us today, not popular teaching in our day is our responsibilities. But ladies and gentlemen, we still have ultimate responsibility when it comes to the riches that God has given us that we live up to the promise of that. Guys, we're supposed to live out what God has put in before a watching world. It's not enough to simply believe. Not enough to just simply say that's true. We have to put feet on that. We have have to walk that out. What does it look like lived out as a Christian? What does it look like if we as Christian people live out every day, day by day, what Jesus said? I'm going to go back to what Jesus said here in just a minute. When you look at these scriptures, you see the, the proper belief, and, and the first point, and then the second point is there's proper behavior. And then the apostle Paul demonstrates this in his own life. 
He demonstrates this in his own life. And this is a big part of this, all right, big point of what we're going to. If you study the life of the Apostle Paul, you know he did not begin as the Apostle Paul. He started out as Saul of Tarsus, right? And he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was on the Sanhedrin court. He was the one that was there when they stoned Stephen. That was the Apostle Paul that was standing there consenting to Stephen's death. Go back. I think that's in Acts chapter 9 if you want to go back and check that. But that's where Saul started. He was, he was Saul of Tarsus, not Paul the Apostle, okay? He went out doing his very best to put out the fire that was the church because he knew that that was foreign to what Moses said and that he, he, they were preaching Jesus and Paul wasn't very, or Saul wasn't very happy about that. And he was going around and he was full of hatred. He was full of anger and he was full of bitterness towards them to the point to where he even held them to prison. He even, the Bible says that he was there and, and made them blaspheme. I mean, there were some things that behind Saul of Tarsus was ugly and was bad. But something happened, okay? And thank God, he had a head-on collision with Jesus Christ. He ran into the resurrected Lord. He didn't hear a doctrine about Jesus. He'd heard that. He didn't hear a teaching about Jesus. He ran into Jesus for himself, all right? Can I tell you something? He was never the same again. God started to work in that man's life that resonated from then on out. Not only that, but see this. The Apostle Paul was a Jew of the Jews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And they were, as far as they were concerned, every Gentile was just a dog, not worthy of any blessing, not worthy of any covenant, not worthy of any mercy whatsoever. But God took that man, okay, that man, that bent on that destruction. God took that man and turned him into Paul, the preacher of the grace of God. And Paul went around the world for the rest of his life, living out what God had done for him. Paul went around the world for the rest of his life, making sure everybody knew the message of Jesus Christ. And he preached it to the Jews, and he preached it to the Gentiles, and he preached to the people who looked like him, and he preached to the people who didn't look like him in any direction. He preached it to people who sounded like him. He preached to the people who didn't look anything like him, period. And when you look at what God did in Paul's life, there's absolutely a demonstration of what it takes to have a changed life. Now, I'm not going to claim originality for this part of this preaching. I heard somebody say it this morning, and it resonated with me. But ready? Right belief. Okay? Got to have that first. That's the foundation. Right belief plus right behavior over time equals a changed life. Okay? That formula works. That's biblical. We can find it. It's all the way through the Bible. Lord, we can go even in the Old Testament. We can go back and look. When I, and I see some of what's going on around us. And I want to say, even to us, I want to say, listen, some of us have been so saved so long, we've sort of gotten crunchy. I mean, our, we've sort of gotten, we, we've sort of set in our ways. You know what I'm talking about that. We're, our pages are yellowed. We've been in this thing so long. But I want you to hear something today. Right belief, right behavior over time equals a changed life. And a life changed for the glory of God. A life that reflects the goodness of Jesus Christ. A life that reflects the mission that God has for us to live out as Christians. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. That's not an instant thing. Can I tell you something that God does with the people that God uses? God sends them the long way around. God lets them go the long way around. Moses was 40 years in the wilderness. But now by the time Moses gets ready to go back down to Egypt, Moses left uh, and, and came back an old man. All right, but he was a man that God had done a mighty work in. Paul, when we look at him, he had a two or three years where he went and sat in Arabia. The Bible said he departed and didn't go see anybody till he got some, God was working some things out with him. I want to tell you something today. We need this formula. We need this in our lives today. Listen, it's wonderful, and I'm thankful. I thank God, and I don't know who all is watching today. I hope everybody's got a chance to see what we're doing. I don't know, but I want to say this to you. It's not enough to simply say, man, that's good preaching. I like the Bible. Okay, I, I hear you. That, that nobody's life will ever be changed because they own a Bible. Listen, if owning a Bible would change your life and make you more like Jesus, I, can I tell you what we'd do? We'd make sure everybody owned the Bible. Now, I'd be more radical than that if we thought baptizing you would change you. We, I promise you, we, I got some strong men in my church family. We'd drag you through there. We would. And you know what we'd do? We'd just build one out in the parking lot. And when we, you get out of the car, we'd just drag you out and drag you through the baptistry. And somebody said, I'd be mad just while we were dragging you to it. I mean, because after you came out, you'd be saying, thank the Lord. Right? 
Guys, it's not a question. It's not enough to believe. Okay, it's not enough to just simply say that's true. We've got to say, wait a minute, I've got to live this. Okay, when you hear preaching or teaching about prayer, you don't just need to say, man, I think God answers prayer. You need to pray like you believe God answers prayer. If you're going to preach on forgiveness, and I'm going to preach on forgiveness, and if we're going to receive truth about forgiveness, then I've got to be willing to forgive as God has forgiven me. If I'm going to preach on the goodness and the grace of God, then I've got to walk that out in my daily life. That's got to be part of my identity. That's got to be part of my thumbprint or part of my fingerprint as a Christian. Has not, not that we just sit and learn, but that we go and live. Okay, the right behavior over time. Okay, because here's the truth. And I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings today, and I'm certainly not trying to have a holy war. I just want to say it like this. Guys, when you look at where you are right this minute, know that between here and heaven, the scenery changes. Okay? Know that things look different than they did when you started. Okay? Know that, th and, that and that's God's order. That's God's order. That's the progress of the Christian life. That's the progress of the Christian life. Christian, listen, there ought to be things that you outgrow. Christian, listen, there ought to be some things that you lay aside. Christian, listen, there ought to be some things from time to time that in our lives we look back on that and say, thank, thank God for mercy. I mean, because we see ourselves, we've grown, we've overcome, we've got past some things. I want to tell you something today, and I'm not meaning it, and I'll get to it in a minute. But right belief plus right behavior over time is a changed life. I want to tell you something today. We ought to everyone be saying, Lord, help us to live a changed life in front of a watching world. Lord, help us, all of us, to live a changed life in front of a watching world. The next part of this, and I guess the, the test of this would be, what do we do with Jesus Christ? What do we do with Jesus Christ? Now, when I think about what we do with Jesus Christ, it comes down to this, okay? Either he's who he said he was, or he was a deluded madman and a fraud, okay? If he's who he said he was, then he's not just a religious teacher. He was not just a religious worker. He was not just a healer who did some good works, okay? He is the very son of God. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's the one who gives us the instructions on what it looks like to please God. He's the one who gives us a demonstration, and I'm going to preach on that right now in just a minute. But if we see him as everything the Bible claims for him, then we have to see him as preeminent and not just prominent. Now, guys, we, are, we all stop at prominence. We'll all stop at prominence. We love Jesus at Christmas. Who don't love Jesus at Christmas time? We all love Jesus at Easter because we women wear his hat to church and we go have ham and turkey or whatever and hunt Easter eggs, right? I mean, everybody loves those times of the year. And I'm not mocking those times. I'm just saying. But here's what I want you to hear, okay? The prominence lets us get by with who we want to be. Prominence lets us get by with how we want to feel. Prominence lets us get by with how we want to act. Okay, prominence lets us get by with the way things have always been. Okay, preeminence will not allow us to do that. Preeminence will not allow us to do that. When I let him have preeminence, he's not just part of my life. He's Lord of my life. Are you hearing me today, Christian? If I stop at prominence, that means I'm still driving and maybe Jesus goes with me. My prayer list is all about me. My prayer list is what I want to get done and how I want that to look. My prayer list looks like my scheming, all right? Does anybody in here ever go through a drive through window? Can I tell you what we do at the drive through window? There are some restaurants, and I'm not going to identify them around here. You might as well just pull up there and just say, listen, whatever you all want to give me in a bag... And ever how much you want to charge me, just do it that way. That way you won't be disappointed. 
right? I mean, because I've been through some of them, and you pull up, and you can holler, and you can say, call that back to me every trick, because I'm always like, Look, can you call that back to me so I can make sure I said it right, you know? And, and then, but you get down the road, and you didn't even order a hot dog, and there's five hot dogs in the bag, right? I mean, or you didn't even know that place had hot dogs, and then you go, and you get home, and, and my wife goes, I wrote down the order, I'm like, I, and I read the order to them. And she's like, uh, nah. well, call them. And she does. She calls them. <laughs> but now, prominence, okay, that's what we do. We go to God in prayer, and it's our list. It's our ones. It's our needs. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't take our needs to God. But when he's Lord, my prayer time is different. Because I recognize His Lordship and I recognize that His direction for my life and the way He answers my prayers is going to look probably different than I would have wanted it under prominence. When I let Him be Lord, I quit trying to have my scheme. When I let Him be Lord, I quit trying to have my way and I realize His way is better. Don't stop at prominence. Jesus didn't die on the cross, be buried and resurrected and is seated at the right hand of God just so he could be part of your entourage, okay? He wants to be Lord. He wants to be Lord. The people who practice prominence with Jesus Christ in their lives, ready? They are the hero of their own story. They are the hero of their own, they have to be. They're the hero of their own story. And, but now I'm going to tell you something. When he's preeminent, we recognize not ourselves as the hero of the story. We recognize him as the hero of our story. There's a psalm that David wrote. I'm, I'm not going to, I'll, I'll get it wrong which number it is. But it's one of my very favorites. And it's one of the last things David says. It's one of, at the end of David's life. David sits down to recount everything. And David is sitting there, and he's saying, The giant came out against us, but God delivered me. Saul pursued me, but God took care of me. And he went through all of the great things that everybody said David did. He went through all of the things that everybody gave David credit for. Everybody said, What a great king. And David said, Yeah, but I've got a great God. Okay, David made sure that people understand. David, listen, if it had been up to David to kill Goliath by himself, David would have died that day, and it would have been a really small feast for the birds, remember? But what happened? By God's help and with God's mercy, God helped David overcome. And I want you to see this today. That's the difference between prominence and preeminence. Saul kept the mind of God prominent, but Saul broke God's commandment when it made sense to Saul not to obey and there were times in David's life when he didn't obey either. There are no flawless Christians. There are no flawless followers. That's why we have to thank God for the mercy and the grace of God. But dear Christian, what do you do with Jesus Christ? Do you stop at prominence or do you go on to preeminence? You're going to wrestle that wrestling match from now on. You're going to wrestle that wrestling match from now on. You're going to want to drive until you get to heaven. I, I'll never forget this. One time when all of us were at home, we were on our way to church one Sunday night with my dad. And we had a four-door Oldsmobile, Delta 88 Oldsmobile. It was a gray one. Anybody else have one of those cars? There's just hundreds of them around. But dad, we had one of those things, and all of us were in the car. And this was before the day of car seats. All right, we, there were no car seats. We were all going down the road, and we were, I was in the back, and my brother Todd was standing up in the front seat between mom and dad, okay, and the rest of us were in the back. So we were going on the way to church. Now, it was on a dirt road with ruts in it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about with the ruts? Some of those roads, you don't even have to steer. You can just get the car in the rut, and it'll just go, all right? But we were going down that road, and the dirt road, they had, it was pretty loose gravel, all of that, so we were being careful. And my brother Todd, who was about two or three years old, decided he wanted to drive, okay? Never said a word, just grabbed the steering wheel. And when he pulled it, he got us sideways of the rut. And you know, guess what happened? I mean, we slid from my mother's screen for like 11 minutes before the car got stopped, Okay? And Todd was trying to get out of the steering wheel because he was like, oh, no. 
I'm probably going to be in trouble. And he was. He was in pretty bad trouble. But it took forever for that car to slide as far as it slid. And we went off of a bank and wound up we couldn't push it out to save our lives. Our church people had to get us out of the ditch on the way to church that night, which I think was more embarrassing for my mom and dad than it was for us. We were like, we were like Todd, we, you're going to die. <laughs> we get home, you've had it. And he, we didn't even get home, and he had it. <laughs> but Todd, after that, Todd would not. If he was in the front, he sat down. He got as far from that steering wheel as he could. He's like, oh, I do not want to drive. I, I'm good. Remember right when little kids, they want to drive, they're going to sit in your lap and do the steering wheel, not Todd. No, sir. He sat back. He's like, nope, I'm good. I, you, and you know what he figured out? Sometimes it's better to let Dad drive. All right? If you stop at prominence, you're driving. If you go to preeminence, he drives. Let him drive. Let him drive. Jesus demonstrated for us this the principle that I'm about to preach to you. Turn over to Luke chapter 10. I'm going to hurry here because I, I don't want to take up too much time. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. The Bible says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, What is written in the law? How, how readest thou? And he answered, said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Now, that's right. I mean, that's the great commandment, all in one piece. So Jesus even said of these two things, everything in the law and the prophets hangs on these two things. Loving the Lord your God with all your soul, all your heart, and all your mind first, and then your neighbor as yourself second. Okay? So there he is. You know, and then so... Jesus said, verse 28, and he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, verse 29, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Okay, now that's a good question, and I want to tell you why. Because for Jewish people, there was a lot of people who were not neighbors. Okay, anybody that was not a Jew was not a neighbor. Okay. Remember, in, in, and I think it's in John chapter 4, where Jesus goes through and he stops at Samaria. He runs into the Samaritan woman at the well. Remember that? He goes there and he sits there on the well. And he, they, they are discoursing. They have the conversation back and forth. And everybody comes up. Now, the disciples were sort of standing back. The disciples were going, wait a minute. And I want to tell you why. And it's because the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. They saw them as a half-breed people. They saw them as less than themselves. They didn't value them enough to even reach out to them. The Jewish people were given the law to be a demonstration to the rest of the world what it looks like when a nation follows God. And, and what did they do? The Jewish people didn't follow God. They followed their law. They fell in love with their tradition. And they, and they misinterpreted what that meant. So they hated the Samaritans. So... What do you think the Samaritans did when the Jews hated them? <laughs> well, they hated them right back. They had received force and they gave force back. They had received, they, they were, you know, I, don't, I don't know how to say it the right way, but they responded in kind. And there was a long-running feud. There is to this day between the Jews and Samaritans. I mean, Samaritans, they are still there. And the, the, the riff is still there. And I want to say that there's an ancient divide. And I don't have time to preach on it today. But it was a long-instilled prejudice, racism that was well set in both groups. Okay? So Jesus is preaching on this to this. Who is my neighbor? Okay, he's talking to an affluent member of that society. He's a lawyer. He's talking to somebody that's educated. He's, he's, he's getting ready to answer his question. All right? So, verse 29, he said, And he willing to adjust himself, said, or justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? So look at verse 30. Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. Now, that wouldn't be hard to do. If you've been there, you know that that country is hilly, rocky. I mean, it's, it's way back. I mean, and it's a, it's a wild road that runs from Jerusalem to Jericho. I mean, so it wouldn't be hard to get in trouble on that road, especially in that day. Okay? So, and by the way, the man's just traveling. The traveler hadn't done anything wrong. He's just going. Okay? So, so he goes and he falls among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. So here's a guy laying on the side of the road, beat nearly to death, 
naked and bleeding and everything that can happen to somebody who's in this spot is in this spot. Okay, so look what happens. By chance, there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Religion walked up to where that man was and said, hmm, somebody ought to do something about that, but not me, because I'm a priest, and I need to keep moving. Not me, that ain't really my thing, because, I, you know, he's in the ditch, so I'd have to get down in the ditch with him to get him out. I mean, and he, he's bleeding. I mean, so I'm, I'm going to have to, whatever his reasoning was, the priest, he saw him, okay? He can't say he didn't know. He can't pretend that he didn't see that. He saw him. He looked right at him. And that word saw means to look, at him, look him over, see him, okay? So he, he sees him, and he passes by on the other side. All right? And likewise, a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. So you've got religion that's passed this man by, and then you've also got somebody of the same race that's also passed this man by, a Levite. Okay? Come on. He saw him. He saw, oh, there's a problem. Oh, wait a minute, I see something. Hang on a second. We, you, boy, somebody ought to do something about that. Hey, hang on a minute. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I, they can't say they didn't see. They saw him and dodged it. They saw him and they went around it. They saw what was happening and they, what they do, they passed by on the other side. They said, somebody ought to do something about that. Somebody ought to say something. I've been saying for a long time now, them thieves on that Jericho Road was a problem. I've been saying for a long time now, somebody ought to say or somebody ought to do Did those people's intentions help the man in the ditch? No. He's still beat half to death. He's still bleeding. He's still robbed. He's still laying in the ditch. Look at verse 31. And by chance there came down, excuse me, verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, what did he do? He had compassion. He had compassion. You know what he did? He looked in that ditch and he said, except for the grace of God, that's me. Except for the grace of God, that's my brother. He couldn't look and say he didn't see. He couldn't look and say, I don't know. No, no, he saw. He knew. Okay? So he saw where he was, and look what he did. Had compassion on him. In verse 34, he went to him. Got down off of his beast. Got down off, I guess it was a donkey, got down off of his donkey, maybe it was a horse, I don't know what it was, but whatever he was riding, he got down off of it and went where that man was, okay? He bound up his wounds. He didn't just go down there and say, man, this looks bad. I'm going to see if I can get you some help. No, no. He starts binding up this man's wounds. He starts trying to take care of him. And I want to tell you something. Why? And here's a lesson that the Samaritan had learned, okay? And I believe this. I don't believe this was that man's first trip up and down this road. Uh, the road to Jericho was a well-traveled road. It still is to this day. But the Samaritan has experienced the other side of this and is saying, I'm going to help. He's not going to say, hey, Lord, here am I, send me, as long as they're on my side of the road. Hey, Lord, here am I, send me, as long as they look like me. Hey, Lord, here am I, send me, as long as they sound like me. Hey, Lord, here am I, send me, as long as they live on my side of town. Uh, no, no. God's good intentions don't help the person in the ditch. Believing in the one true God when we do, and they did, didn't help that fellow in the ditch. Going up to the temple as a priest or a Levite, no, they were going through the motions, but their hearts were not changed. Their hearts were not changed. So he goes down to him, binds up his wounds, pouring in the oil and the wine. Now you got to see this, because this is expensive. 
The oil and the wine is where he gives of his own resources to help that man. He doesn't just say, boy, I, I tell you right now. No, no, he said, you know what? I can't help. I, I have these resources. I have the bandages to help bind him up. I have the oil and the wine to pour in it to help with that. And I'm, gonna, I'm standing here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to help. And then he set him on his own beast. Has anybody else in here ever tried to pick up somebody that was unconscious? I'll never forget, there was a buddy of mine a bunch of years ago now, we were on the job, and he cut his hand really bad. I mean, and I mean to the bone really bad. And he looked at it, and when he did, he, he just fell out. I mean, just, and after I looked at it, I thought, I'm probably going to fall out too. I mean, <laughs> it, was, it was pretty bad. But he was, and he's not a big man. He's taller than me. Of course, everybody's taller than me. All right, and ha, oh, ha, you know, everybody's taller than Brother Jeff. All right. But he's taller than me, and he's not heavy. I mean, I'm, I am round. I've always been, somebody said, Brother Jeff, have you ever been in shape? I've been round my whole life, yes. And round is a shape, so yes. But there's my buddy on the ground with blood, I mean, just sort of, you know, and all of that's going on, and he's passed out, and he is as limp as a dish rag, okay? He is on the, on the ground, and I'm going to get him up to get him somewhere. So I'm, I've got him, and... If you hadn't ever done it, I, you don't know how to do it, but I mean, he is on the ground, and I can't get him up to save my life. So I just finally got him by the arm and drug him to the truck and trying to get him up in the truck. I think I wound up with him in the back of the truck. because <laughs> You couldn't get a hold of him to get him up. I mean, it was a lot of work to get him off the ground. And I want to see this. We've got to see this today. Guys, sometimes when we're helping other people, we're going to have to put some effort into it. It's going to take some backbone. It's going to take some grunt work from us. It, if we're going to help, now we can do the priest. We can do the Levite. Can I tell you something else that happened here too? That man got dirty helping, the Samaritan got dirty helping that guy out of that ditch because don't you know he had the blood on him too? Don't you know that there's no way he's going to stand down there and not have the ditch on him too? So he goes down and gets him. And puts him on his own beast, and he brings him to an inn and took care of him. He had to put some time in it. And then the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host. And said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever you spend more, when I come again, I will pay you back. I'll repay you. So let's see the picture. Here's the Samaritan going about his life. He encounters somebody that needs help right now. He encounters somebody that's in the ditch and will not get themselves out. I promise you something. If none of these people have stopped to help this man, if the Samaritan had stopped on the, or looked at it and gone around him, I think the man in the ditch would have died. The Samaritan looks at that and understands, I can't walk by here like I don't see. I can't walk by here like I can't help. I can't walk by here like I don't have some kind of responsibility. Guys, God, please hear this. We as Christians need to quit saying where we are is beyond us. Okay? God has sent us to exactly such a time as this with the truths that we know for exactly such a time as this. God has equipped us for this moment. So the Samaritan is the only one out of the three and breaks racial taboo every way he does it. Breaks racial tradition every way he does it. He can't help but break those traditions. There's a man in the ditch that needs help, and somebody needs to say something. Somebody needs to do something. And he says, wait a minute. I am somebody. And so Jesus finishes up his lesson. Which now of these three do you think was neighbor Unto him that fell among the thieves. 
And he said, he that showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Dear friend, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm really not. And I've had people trying to get me to speak to where we are in our country right now with everything that's going on. And I'll simply say this. It's hard to be racist if you're going to be right with God. It's hard to be racist if you're going to walk with God. So I condemn racism, period. And you should too. We don't like it when everybody sees all white people as the same, okay? Nor should we see all black people the same. We should be able to distinguish between those who are misbehaving and those who are actually protesting something that has needed protesting for a really long time. The police officers with George Floyd need to answer for what they've done. Period. They need to answer for what they've done. The people who are burning and looting and committing all of those crimes need to answer for what they're doing. But that's equal treatment. That's equal justice. And I, I'm for that. How does a Christian respond to that when we see it? How does a Christian, how do we answer the question? It looks like there's not a right answer. How do we say, this is where I stand? And I want to tell you something today. Don't just trust your own philosophy for that, okay? Jesus said it. Stand on the Scriptures. Stand on the Scriptures. Go to the Word. I'll leave you with this thought. So who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? We go to Jesus and we say, hey, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And, and he didn't just say, hey, just believe these things. He said, go in and do these things. Live this out. Guys, can I tell you something that the world needs worse today than it's ever needed at any time ever? Okay. is a church that doesn't just preach the truth, but a church that lives the truth out. A church that doesn't just talk about love, but a church that actually loves. Christians in neighborhoods that actually live out the great commandment and the great commission. Guys, if there's ever been a time when our faith needs to take us into some steps that may look unfamiliar to us or maybe even uncomfortable to some of us. That's the clarion call of the master. Don't miss our moments. Gosh, let's don't miss our moments. Would you bow your heads, please? I'm through preaching. I want to ask Miss Kathy if she'll come play a verse of a song. Let's pray. Our Father, today we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the truth that is here. And Lord, I ask that you'll help us to believe about you correctly. And then, Lord, help us to behave according to the riches that you have given us. And then, Father, I pray that you will help us that our lives would demonstrate like you did with the Apostle Paul. Lord, like you did with the story here of the Samaritan. And, Lord, not, not just the story, but, Lord, how you in John 4 went and sat down with the Samaritan to share with her your truth. Father, help us not to just hear, but, Lord, to obey. I pray for that person today that's struggling the hardest. Lord, may they not find truth just in me or just in what I say, but, Lord, may they find it in you. Lord, be Lord of our lives. Be Lord of our lives. And we'll be careful to thank you and give you the praise for all that you do. We ask these things today in Jesus' precious name.
for thank you for tuning in today and, and I always say that and my staff makes fun of me for using the tuning in thing <laughs> but thank you for being with us today for our service time together and remember next Sunday morning at 11 o'clock we'll be here for in the main service and we are all excited about that too and we're looking forward to getting everybody back here uh, now there'll be some announcements during the week to talk about what that'll look like and there'll be a couple of changes that we've made and you'll be able to see them when you get here uh, but we're so excited about having you back now, but let me say this too, to our, the people who are in the at-risk groups, for the people who need to be careful about your health for a few more weeks, please know that we're going to be live streaming everything we do. So you're not going to miss anything on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. We'll be doing streaming that too. So you will, you will have opportunities to have the access to the services. Uh, but, and we understand, and we don't want you to feel like we've forgotten about you. Uh, we, we want you to know we understand and, and appreciate where you're coming from. So know that we're mindful of that too. But thank you so much for coming out to be with us today. Um, take today's message and think about it. Take today's message and pray that through. And may God apply it not just to your heart, but may God apply it to mine too. A lot to work on there. But thank you for taking time out for us today. And thank you for those who are able to come be in our service today. And we hope that you'll have a good week. Watch for the announcements this week. There will be several that will be coming out. So be watching for that. Be sure and share them when you see them, and we'll get those in the right places. So thank you, and hope you have a blessed afternoon.